audience. Welcome, everyone. My name is Matthew. I host the podcast Junior Resource Investing. We'll just do a couple little quick and dirty laundry list items here before we get to the good stuff. Uh, as always, this is being recorded, so just be aware of that. Um, uh, the recording will be available on YouTube shortly thereafter. Uh, Q and A, right? This is this is. I would like this to be as interactive as we can. So please fire your questions off into the chat at any time. If it fits well into the conversation as we go, I'll, I'll try to fit it in on the fly. But if not, I'll make sure that we carve out some time at the end for your questions. So yeah, please, please engage. And standard disclaimers, all, all standard disclaimers apply here. Not, not uh, financial advice, find, you know, uh, to speak to your own financial advisor. With that out of the way though, the title of this pod, the title of this podcast, pardon me, the title of this panel is uh, Lithium, Lithium, Powering Tomorrow, Future of Extraction, Processing and Recycling. Lithium is the future, and there's really not much of a debate to it, right? The, the potential for the future and our ability to realize that potential flows through lithium. But this means far more than what might immediately come to mind, namely batteries and EVs and the electrical revolution. Yes, rapidly growing our lithium production capacity is, of course, a huge part of that. But transitioning from consuming lithium to using lithium, closing the loop and creating a more circular economy for our battery metals is also an integral part of that future and its potential for realizing a more sustainable world. This then is the topic of today's panel. Uh, I'm joined by two traditional lithium explorers representing all the different styles of investment theses and, and, and deposit types, but I'm also joined by a company dedicated to cracking the code on lithium recycling in pursuit of that lithium of that circular economy I referenced earlier. Joining me today are three gentlemen. We have Ali Haji, who is the CEO at Ion Energy, Carlos Vicens, who's CEO and director at Full Circle Lithium, and Steve Rentschler, who's CEO at Nevada, Nevada Lithium Resources. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. I hope you have a have a good chat here with me today. So let's just super basic question, right? Boilerplate just off the start. You know, company introductions. Why don't you take a moment here in turn and explain to me and our audience who you are where you operate, and then basically just provide an elevator pitch for your company. And, and Ali, do you want to lead us off? Sure. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you to my panelists. Uh, my name is Ali Haji, Chief Executive Officer, Director, and Co-Founder of Ion Energy, a company that was started in 2017 that went public in 2019, well before this uh, lithium upheaval, so to speak, uh, with an asset in Mongolia. So we currently have two assets in Mongolia. Uh, one is uh, 81,000 hectare license, very similar to Thacker Pass, so plays and evaporites. Importantly, we have a 29,000 hectare license, Urgat Naran in Dorngovi province that's showing significant promise in the brine space and located extremely close to infrastructure. This past summer, we also acquired about 6,500 hectares of uh, very early stage outcrops of pegmatite in the Northwest Territories. So we now are, are operating in two separate jurisdictions, covering all mediums of lithium with some catalysts underway, including an inferred resource as well as a strategic investment. Excellent. Thank you, Ali. And Steve, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Sure. Thanks, Matt. I'm Steve Rentschler, CEO and Director of Nevada Lithium Resources. We are developing the Bonnie Claire asset three hours northwest of Las Vegas in Nevada. Uh, we have a PEA that was finished two years ago, preliminary economic assessment that showed very robust uh, economics at lower lithium prices than we have right now. Uh, Mining.com called us the third largest uh, sedimentary slash clay and hard rock deposit uh, in the world right now. We have far more resource than, than we need. Uh, we have basically uh, a project that we think can be upsized, but we're looking at a 30,000 ton a year uh, lithium carbonate uh, production rate for 40 years, starting somewhere around 2029 or 2030. Uh, we have excellent infrastructure right off of Route 95, as I said, only three hours from uh, Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, we think we have a very uh, interesting value proposition because it's taken us the past two years to essentially consolidate 100% ownership under Nevada Lithium. And so we've been relatively silent and we're just starting to come uh, to the market now and show ourselves uh, as we progress with our pre-feasibility study. Thank you, Stephen. On to you, Carlos. Sure. So I'm the I'm the company that uh, is not really um, doesn't have any resource uh, per se. Uh, so we are Full Circle Lithium. My name again is Carlos Vicens. I'm the CEO, founder, and director um, of Full Circle, and we have a lithium and processing and manufacturing company in the state of Georgia in the U.S. We currently have a 2,000 ton lithium carbonate facility at the plant, and we're working on three distinct 
business units to feed that plant in Georgia, one being a battery recycling um, unit, another one being a midstream or what we call midstream or feedstock recycling unit, which is, works with industrial and chemical waste that contains lithium and recycle that. And the third unit would be the lithium refinery, which mostly works with uh, companies in the upstream side, such as mining and other potential uh, companies that have I would say any type of lithium compound that needs to be, have additional uh, processing done in order to be sold to the market. Excellent. Yeah, and, and three three different interesting companies here, and I think they kind of like the diversity here. So I think, and this is probably a good segue. I don't need to tell you guys that the junior resource space is extremely crowded, right? There's a lot of different companies vying for investor dollars. So why don't I just follow up question then? What makes you unique, right? What what is new or different that you are doing that otherwise will make you stand out from your peers? And so I'll, I'll take it back to Ion. Sure. Uh, with Ion Energy's uh, venture into Mongolia, we were first movers in the lithium space. So we started looking at lithium in 2017, a jurisdiction that, of course, neighbors the largest uh, consumer on the planet today, that being China. Uh, currently, all lithium is imported from either LATAM or Australia for Chinese consumption. So being able to find lithium in a jurisdiction so close to the, mar the major market of the planet, of course, differentiates us from various other players that are in the lithium space today. Uh, beyond that, uh, despite us being first movers, we've now seen the uh, other organizations or global organizations enter Mongolia seeking lithium and investing in lithium. So we appear to have been on the right track and we're on the cusp of, of course, unearthing the value there. Excellent. And to you, Steve? Uh, I think what differentiates us right now, and again, we're, we are one of what I call sort of the the next tier, the, the next movement of uh, lithium producers coming forward. These are the sedimentary and the clay uh, deposits that frankly have never been needed before because the global demand for lithium wasn't there previously. Uh, but obviously uh, by being uh, located in, in the United States with all the benefits of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that have been legislated by the US Congress, we are differentiated from our global peers in that way. But at the individual level, we have a, a couple of different things that we're working on at Nevada Lithium uh, that we essentially had put in place and also had geology help us out uh, that would help uh, essentially lithium end uh, users be able to differentiate the lithium that went into their products. So really the two things that we talk about are one, our mining method, which uh, is something proposed in our PEA and which we're advancing for our, our uh, pre-feasibility study. And this is called uh, borehole mining, which is essentially uh, using uh, high pressure water to erode the material down at depths uh, at Bonnie Claire. And this is very, very easily movable or friable material that sloughs off goes down at the bottom uh, of the well sump and is pumped back up through the annulus and directly into a plant where we will make lithium battery grade lithium carbonate, something that we've already done. So that's a differentiator. Uh, it's used in various uh, other places, um, but in not nearly the scale that we're talking about. Cameco uses it at Scar Lake, Amerigo uses it to reclaim their tailings. And the second is our recovery uh, process, which does not use sulfuric acid. And this is where the geology comes into play. We are a sedimentary deposit in which the lithium is not encapsulated in the clay, so we don't have to burn through it with acid to basically recover it. We sort it out, we go through what's called calcination, which is heating it up, and we add a reagent, sodium sulfate, and we wash the lithium out in warm water. So this has obvious benefits in terms of uh, tailing, um, acidic drainage from, from tailings, things like that. And we're also in one of the best places on earth for alternative energy, solar, wind, and the Hoover Dam uh, down our, our location. Again, uh, a couple hours northwest of, of Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, excellent. And then Carlos, this one is kind of tailor-made for you guys into context of this one. So do you want to just explain to us the, the, what makes you stand out? Sure. So I, in my prior life, I was a CFO of a, a upstream asset in, in Argentina, a, a brine asset. But uh, and the upstream side is uh, very lucrative in terms of you know what can potentially be done there. But in our case, in this new venture that we started, we moved downstream. And one of the reasons we moved downstream is because we saw a lack of processing capacity outside of the big companies. So you have the typical Abramals, the SQMs, the Alchems, and so forth, and the China 
Chinese, of course, that do process the majority of final products that get sold uh, into the market. But there are not there are no intermediates or smaller producers of, li of manufacturing manufactured lithium. So that's one of the reasons we we, uh, we started this plant in Georgia. We only have 2,000 tons of capacity now, but with our current infrastructure, we can uh, expand capacity up to 10,000 tons in the current building. Uh, that being said, we can build additional of that, of that in the future if we need it. So that in itself is very new. In fact, if once we start producing from that plant, I think it's the only plant that has been uh, built and, and producing lithium over the last 20 years, uh, specifically in, in North America. So that's part of our differential there. And then in order to feed that plant, we've also built three distinct business units, uh, which are all of them in itself are very uh, unique. One is the uh, recycling of uh, chemical and industrial waste that contains lithium. This is a market that nobody is looking at. And we believe that there's a significant lucrative market there that we can obviously urban mine, as people call it, or recycle lithium from waste that's being treated and disposed and not, you know, not being taken advantage of in terms of where the market is. Uh, then the battery recycling, of course, you're going to see a lot of these batteries come from three distinct ways. One is end-of-life batteries, the other one is off-spec batteries and other off-spec cathode materials that are coming out of all the production of batteries that's currently happening in, in North America. And then the lithium refinery business was built around what Stephen and Ali are doing, right? So the gentleman here and, and many other companies, usually what they want to focus on is in mining. Not necessarily, well, I'm not saying all of them, but generally they don't want to focus on the final stage of production. That being said, Stephen and Ali may have a different view on that, but some companies do not. So they have a, what we call a precursor material, which could be a lithium sulfate or lithium chloride that would need additional processing in order to be sold into the market. And that's when we come in with our plant, lithium carbonate plant, and help them get to that point. So that's why we believe we're unique. We have a, a pretty good value proposition in all distinct uh, lines of business. And, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously trying to set up in a, in a location that also benefits um, the, I would say, the America's market. Excellent. Uh, and so what I found interesting when I was kind of sitting down to do my research for this project was that, and and so Carlos and, and I mean, all three of you gentlemen have already kind of touched on this, but all of the potential deposit types for, for lithium are present here, right? And then, and so you, you have your brine and your hard rock and your clay and sedimentary and the urban mine, as, as Carlos referenced there as well. So I thought I would take, and there, and there is decent daylight between you on these on these topics, and so I thought I would ask you gentlemen to, to discuss your deposit type, and you all have multiple, or I know that, that you have multiple each, but but uh, just to help me and help our audience understand your project and the deposit type that you are pursuing and its advantages. And so, you know, I wanna, I'll, 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 I'll have you go first again, Ollie, but I mean, my understanding when I was looking through your, your slide deck is that your your brine deposit looks like it's going to be very cheap, very economic, and very nimble in terms of in terms of extraction and production. Do you just want to kind of take us away there and talk about brine and touch on clay afterwards, if you like? Sure, absolutely. Um, in terms of brine today, you know the the traditional way of of producing a concentrate was through evaporation ponds, which are uh, hugely expensive. They they require a lot of earth moving, large capex, and of course, are not very environmentally uh, friendly. So we've seen an advent or, or, or um, the movement towards uh, lit direct lithium extraction, which, you know, as, as early as two years ago would have been a dirty word in the lithium industry that wasn't spoken of because nobody had gotten there yet. Uh, folks like Carlos at Full Circle, well, they're getting there. Um, and that's a, that's a testament to, to what's been done technologically to allow DLE to come to fruition. Uh, where we're situated with Urgat Naran in Mongolia, we are seven kilometers from the closest power supply, the national grid. Uh, we're also within 50 kilometers of high-speed rail into Ulaanbaatar and Beijing. So from a logistical perspective and having been in Mongolia for the last 14 years, uh, my chairman built and sold a mine in, or, or uh, a mine in 2011. Uh, we brought a gold producer online in 14 months from Greenfield to, to first gold pour. Uh, you've got enough skilled labor. Your, your cost of labor is significantly less than if you were operating in the Americas. And of course, let's not forget the environmental footprint associated with shipping over 15,000 miles uh, from China for processing and ultimate consumption, whereas we are within 150 kilometers of that border. So the brine asset that we have in Mongolia, we believe will 
will be at the bottom of uh, the cost curve relative to any of our peers. And of course, having infrastructure and power so close by uh, gives us that much more of an advantage. So we are very much focused on our Brian asset in Mongolia today. Our other project, Bavayol, as I mentioned, the more clay evaporite project, uh, not taking a back seat, uh, but we certainly have prioritized Rugaknaran today and we will continue to advance that asset. Excellent. Thank you, Ali. And so, Steve, I'll pass it to you, right? I mean, you have a different sort of deposit. You are articulated nicely already some of the advantages you have there, but do you just want to take a quick quick opportunity just to provide some context and color for that? Sure. Uh, you know, the way I look at it is uh, with the, the evolution of the EVs coming into the demand profile for lithium, it, this is a, a totally different ballgame than what we had previously. So, we're all aware of the brines, which I would imagine probably the first to be exploited for lithium. So this is just lithium that's in solution um, and exploited through evaporation ponds, or as Ali was saying now, the, the new direct lithium extractions are basically the, I call them black boxes because they're, they're tailor-made to individual deposits to recover the lithium, uh, that those are being utilized on the brines now. And then you have the hard rock. So traditional, it's, it's, it is what it sounds like. Um, the hard rock materials, you'll see these, of course, in Quebec, you'll see them in Australia, other places, but where the, the material is, you know, dug up, blasted, whatever, and sent away, concentrated, and then upgraded most of the time in a, in, in a different place. And then we finally get to the evaporitics or the, the sediment deposits, and, and I believe you're going to see this, uh, this type of deposit absolutely take over uh, Nevada in the U.S., which I believe is going to become the centerpiece of the U.S. lithium industry. And this is just over time, you know, volcanoes and wind blowing uh, things around and being laid down inside of, uh, of uh, uh, inland seas and, and lakes. And it, just think of big blankets of lower grade lithium that over millions of years were, were deposited. And until this time, they frankly, they weren't really needed. Um, and, and I think they got lumped into sort of everything, all clays are alike. And clays can refer to a lot of things. It can be the size of the particles, it can be the actual particles. But suffice it to say, I believe that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these different projects are all going to be exploited in, in different ways. Um, they're going to be, I think you see, because you see Thacker, you see going farther up north to Jindali a whole host of other projects that so far haven't been identified. You've seen other ones down in, in Mexico, like um, uh, in, in the Sonoran Desert. Um, uh, Rhyolite Ridge is, is another one. They're all going to be necessary. The recycling is going to be necessary because when you're talking about trying to basically take commodity from, say, 500,000 tons a year of, of lithium carbonate equivalent to 2.5 or 3 million uh, tons over the course of six or seven years, I can tell you that's never been done in the history of, of a commodity. It's a 20, 25, 30% compounded annual growth rate. The wheels start to fall off the bus of, of industry, you know, basically mature industry like copper, if you go above GDP plus or minus one or 2%. So all of these projects are gonna be needed. Now that doesn't mean that we're gonna have to uh, be able to circumvent permitting or anything like this, but the need is there. And I think you're going to see the sedimentary deposits play a very, very large role in the overall global uh, supply of lithium going forward. Hmm. No, excellent. And then I, I'll, I'll bypass my own uh, need to reflect on that one, but Carlos, I'll let you take the floor here and you can, and urban mine, right? So maybe a brief explanation of what that is and then highlight its advantages in terms of what it means for you. Sure, and just one more comment on what Steve was saying. I, I remember I was I was in lithium since 2007 and at that time, Marcus was much smaller and every every project was fighting for capital and it, they were, a lot of people were saying that this project, they're all mutually exclusive, right? And in this case, every project is gonna be needed. We're gonna need every single mine and every single type of deposit. So I just wanted to add that, that you know, a lot of these projects, um, or at least in the in the past, they were trying to fight against each other, saying who's better in this and that. Now, I think, you know, we need to come together because all these projects are gonna be needed. Uh, and that takes me to urban mining, which is, uh, that's a different type of project, I would say, or a different type of resource that it's, um, that is, readily available, right? So what is urban mining? It's essentially recycling or mining lithium and other materials as well, better materials, but let's, and because we're talking about lithium, that has already been mined. So for example, uh, like I mentioned before in, in our um, introduction to the company, we are recycling 
chemical industrial waste that has utilized a lithium compound and has a waste material that's usually water-based, and they're treating that material and disposing of it together with the lithium and other materials. So what we're doing there is that we're installing a processing plant at the client site, extracting the lithium and also extracting some of the impurities. In fact, the impurity removal is a lot more stringent at that point than you would ever have at the upstream level, meaning at the mine, because these are very, very, very high tech or very uh, specific type of specs specifications that the client needs in order to produce their product. So highly, highly uh, pure uh, lithium chloride, for example, in this example, but it could be a lithium carbonate or lithium um, sulfate or whatever that is that the client needs. So that's on that specific one. Another lithium urban mining would be on the battery recycling side, which more or less everybody understands what that is. We're building a lot of batteries for EVs and industrial uh, equipment, as well as energy storage devices. So these batteries are coming up due, meaning they're at the end of life, or they have some spec issues, or they're not working. And the materials within that battery can be recycled. So again, you're going to have a lot of these batteries. It's just starting to come. Uh, a lot of the batteries are still being developed. Uh, the growth is not coming to the recyclers just yet. But over the next, I would say, five to 10 years, you're going to see a wave of batteries coming into the recycling, um, I would say, age. And you're going to see companies such as ourselves and others uh, take advantage of that uh, in order to recycle better materials. And the last one, which is not a recycling uh, I would say urban mining is trying to help and understand the needs of upstream assets that provide you with a, uh, a product that is not necessarily saleable or they can take advantage of purifying or processing further in order to get maximum value for their product in the market. So if, if uh, for example, a mine produces a lithium chloride solution or a lithium carbonate, a technical grade, we can upgrade that into a technical grade, I'm mean, sorry, a battery grade product and then sell it for a lot more in terms of a premium base in the, in the market. So those are the, the three distinct kind of ways that we're trying to do business at our side and how we differentiate ourselves. But we're tied to the hip with the miners. I mean, whatever they produce goes into another product and then that product comes to us and then we can help them as well get better products into the market. So, uh, of course, we're all uh, working together in the lithium space. So it's just a little bit uh, of, a, of a different aspect of the manufacturing of lithium. No, thank you, guys. And I mean, I think that you're articulating things, something that I think is critical for people to understand. And I think that the market at large fails to appreciate just the sheer scale. I mean, a literal order of magnitude in terms of, of coming to man within a, you know, a years, right? And then there's going to be this whiplash moment where uh, I don't know what it's going to look like, but eventually something almost has to break. If anything close to coming to man is ever met or ever realized that, that, that you know, companies such as these three are exactly where investors want to be. Uh, and so, I mean, I think, you know, as a transition, you're starting to see uh, jurisdictions and countries placing, increasing, I would argue, still woefully insufficient, but increasing priority on critical minerals, right, or, or jurisdictional support in general for these issues. And so I thought I would, again, just, you know, the next question is then that question of jurisdictional support, right? What what are your, you know, regional or federal jurisdictional advantages? And again, that helps set you apart from your peers. And this could be, yeah, critical mineral designation, government funding, battery plants, or, you know, potential gigafactories, or even just, you know, general government support, whether that's permitting or incentives or low taxes, et cetera, right? And so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll circle back to you and let you kind of take that one. Sure. Um, I, I'm probably in the most exotic of jurisdictions uh, <laughs> relative to my peers here. But uh, Mongolia is, uh, you know, it's a very recent democracy. In the 1991, it fell off the Soviet bloc. It is a true democracy that has elections every two, every four years. Uh, it is a, a new jurisdiction from a mining perspective relative to the rest of the world, purely because it sits perhaps 30 years um, uh, in the past, perhaps where Africa was 30 years ago. A uh, million and a half square kilometers, of which only 1% has been explored. It is home to Rio Tinto's Oyutolgoy uh, copper gold mine, which employs 15,000 people in country and is the third largest copper gold uh, deposit in the world. Rio Tinto has put about $20 billion into that, that project. So if a global major like Rio Tinto is signing off in a jurisdiction, hopefully um, the viewers and listeners that are worried about the jurisdictional risk have that uh, cleared. But I will say that the government has been extremely supportive of what we've done 
not only with Ion Energy, but Step Gold, a company that I was affiliated with uh, prior to, to focusing entirely on Ion. You know, the government did help fund the the growth of the, that 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 operation to bring it to production. Uh, they buy all the gold. They were they were paying a small premium to spot during uh, the the Russia Ukraine crisis. And in terms of critical metals, uh, you know, I've I've been out to Mongolia now over uh, a dozen times, and and in the last few occasions, I've visited with various strategics that were interested in our operations and from various na different nationalities. We've met with the Minister of Mines in country on various occasions. They've uh, they've asked us to bring in any sort of expertise that allows us to advance our assets because Mongolia wants to create a beneficiated product that ultimately generates revenue and employment in country, allowing them to export a product that is, of course, beneficiated and has a higher tax bracket. Beyond that, uh, during PDAC this year, the Minister of Mines visited Toronto with his delegation, as well as the opposition leader of parliament. Um, you know, they both stood up at this breakfast and they both said the exact same thing. So imagine seeing that either in Canada with the Liberals and the Tories, or in the US with the Republicans and the Democrats. It's, it's highly unlikely that two political parties sit in the same room and agree to the same thing. Uh, I was then sort of accosted uh, by the minister and he, he said, you know, get your feasibility as quickly as possible because we'd like to fast track your permitting. Hmm. That's something you don't hear in any jurisdiction. So we are very long Mongolia. We believe it's a fantastic jurisdiction to do business in and we thank the government for all their support thus far. Hmm. Excellent. And over to you, Steve. Uh, yeah, the um, when I think about Nevada, you know, I, I can't think of a better place uh, that you could possibly want to to, to build a mine. You know, so Ali's sort of in the Wild West there in terms of untapped potential. And I mean, and we're sitting here literally in the Wild West uh, in Nevada, the Silver State, with a 150 uh, years worth of unbelievable mining history. And, you know, even recently, the, the governor of the state going up to Toronto uh, with trade delegation, given an unbelievable interview in, in which he announced that you know, Nevada was was open for business to, to all the Canadian companies, all the U.S. companies. He wanted to know how he's going to extract all the value that he possibly could uh, from from lithium, full circle, recycling, everything going going forward. Didn't just want to be a miner. Um, you know, in terms of infrastructure, everything that we have there to, to the governor saying that, you know, he's he's going to basically uh, shorten the, the permitting uh, exponentially. Now, obviously, we know that that can happen. And, and just so everybody's aware, too, in the U.S., the, the states of, of Nevada and Arizona are actually uh, owned predominantly 75, 85 percent by the, the federal government. So we have a very, you know, well understood. However, it's a, it's a very strict permitting process. So, you know, from my perspective, with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, combined with the government, the governor's support, so the state level, and then clearly, you know, these the, the local areas, if you've never been to Nevada, obviously you have Las Vegas down by the south, and then you have just huge areas where there was mining in the past, but, but essentially nothing. And there's this tremendous, tremendous need to rehabilitate these places. So I believe the local support will be there at all levels, which is extremely powerful. I, I just want to take a second and go back to uh, what Carlos was saying, uh, because I think there's a subtlety to lithium that a lot of people don't don't quite understand if you haven't been around commodities for a lot. And that is that, you know, there are going to be a lot of, of these projects that can't produce a final, a battery grade, uh, either uh, lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide or something else, just by virtue of the geology. And so you're going to have this need for processes like Carlos has and, and others have to be able to take that technical grade stuff and get it up to where you can put it into a battery. I mean, our project, we happen to be able to do it, but not every everyone will be able to. You also have a distorted market, right? Because the Inflation Reduction Act and who's a friend of the US, who's a friend of China, all this sort of stuff. And the reason I mention this is because it screws up pricing. And I believe this is going to give us tremendous upwind uh, or pardon me, uh, a tremendous tailwind going forward, which will put an upward uh, pricing uh, type of a, a, of a support structure in place. And, to, and for people to think about it, whenever you have distortions and you can't have clear clearing market prices, et cetera, in an in efficient way, things get all out of whack and projects get del delayed. And you're, as I said, we all seem to agree that you're going to need all of these projects going forward. 
So, you know, from my perspective in the U.S., the EVs are here to stay. They're in through legislation. And it's, it's up to the entire industry to come up with a way to get the material. And I think it's going to be harder than a lot of people think. And there's a lot of value to be uncovered in all of these different projects. Hmm. Well said. And it looks like we might have to buy Carlos some to Carlos some time here. Maybe, well, I don't, I just, there's a couple of excellent questions here from the audience. Maybe this is a good, a good opportunity for us. Uh, Mason Barnett, and uh, I guess maybe I'll let both you guys take a crack at this, but maybe uh, uh, if you want to go first, but are there any DLE projects looking to come online in the next three months? And where do where does the international battery metals or IBAT modular process fall into the upcoming projects? Yeah, both of you gentlemen, you can take a stab at that if you like. Sure. Um, in terms of DLE, you know, um, as as we've mentioned out, and Stephen mentioned as well, there's various partners out there that are working on on uh, different technologies that, that suit various uh, different needs. Uh, Carlos and his group at Full Circle have now developed, of course, a 2000 ton plant, and that does use very much what we would call DLE. So that, that, is, that is one that is uh, absolutely in, in production. Yes, it's not a, a, a traditional mine, it is urban mining, but it is the same process. Um, we also have Centenario in Argentina. Uh, which is a joint venture between Aramet and a Chinese group. Uh, they are looking to put out um, anywhere between 20 and 30,000 tons per annum, 99.9 uh, .9 battery grade uh, in the summer of next year. So I think you'll start to see a number of these operations come online here and do it in, 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 in a very short period of time uh, that will prove DLE can be profitable. And I think that's where, you know, Stephen mentioned uh, DLE can be a black box uh, because we have seen other juniors uh, stipulate or, or, or tell us that they've produced 99.9 .9 battery grade, but you don't know what, what that cost the market or what that ton cost. And as a result, it's not really commercially viable. So the short answer to your question is you will see a number of players come online in the next three to six months. Excellent. And uh, I hope you are secretly hoping for a one-on-one -on -one conversation here. I'll, it looks like it's just you and me here for the for the time being. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Graham here as another one to and, and another good question here as well from the audience. He says there's historically been an issue where the lithium spot price isn't actually a perfect reflection of prices that are being paid. Uh, there's been pushback this last year related to that. And he's just wondering, when do you think the real price of lithium uh, will, will rise to be where the spot price is or was? Well, I think a lot of it's based on contracts and, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's never quite a uh, one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, the LME has had conversations to introduce lithium to the, the, the metals exchange over in London. I think that'll help change the narrative around the pricing a fair bit. Uh, but for now, we're really at the mercy of uh, the spot contracts and the contracts that are in place by all the offtake uh, consumers. Okay. And Steve, did you catch that that question there? It was just a question around, uh, I'll just reiterate it quick and see if you have any additional color. But uh, just there's Graham from the audience that says that there's historically been an issue where lithium spot price isn't actually a perfect reflection of prices being paid. Uh, and, and he's just wondering when you think that the real price of lithium will rise to spot. And, and Ollie just mentioned just uh, this, uh, you know, long-term contracts uh, contributing to that discrepancy. And just wondering if you have anything else to say to that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I tend to think particularly in the early stages, uh, you know, of developing an industry, you're going to have a thing like with traders who've got at certain times of the year have got too much, you know, too little, and you can get these wild swings. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I think, again, with going from 500,000 uh, tons a year up to the need for two and a half, three, three million tons, you sort of have to expect that you're going to get this this volatility at, at, at times. You know, I, I hear that the Chinese traders have a lot to do, just just like they have a lot to do, frankly, with, with copper price swings. But I can't attest to knowing anything. Uh, that's just my guess at this point in time. And again, there's the, also the differences. There's, there's subtleties in what different battery makers need. So unlike sort of four nines copper, I think we're going to see, you know, LCE, meaning one thing in one place and lithium hydroxide meaning something in a different place, just very, very small subtleties. Uh, we'll see going forward. Yeah, welcome back, Carlos. Hope you enjoyed your little vacation there. Uh, I'll, let's just pick up right where we left off, if you don't mind. Just we were talking about jurisdictional support, and and you were kind of uh, you were on 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 the hot seat there on on the bench. And so I'll just let you, if you want to, just discuss your 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 perspective of how jurisdictional support is helping helping full circle along. Sure. I just didn't like what Steve was saying, so I decided. <laughs> to <go. laughs> no, no, no. I, I apologize. So look, I think. When you, when you're in the U.S., normally you you're you're in a much better place. Um, 
So, I mean, that's that's the problem that I, I'm that. I... Oh, sorry, Carlos, you got your mute on there. I'm not sure if I can help you with that. I'm still having some issues, some, but anyway, so when you're in the U.S., you're, you're definitely in a better place than the majority of, um, of, of, of the assets. I was, you know, and to tell you the truth, you go where the best asset is. It doesn't matter where it is. We, we worked for seven years in Argentina. We had a great asset there. We had support from the community. Now, it's not easy to work there, but you can make it work if you have a good asset. So I'll start from there. And you can make anything work anywhere as long as there are assets. And like I said at the beginning, all of these assets are going to be needed. Mongolia, the U.S., Argentina, Chile, you know, everywhere in the world, we're going to need that, Australia and so forth. So in our case, we are in Georgia, in the state of Georgia, in the U.S., in the manufacturing uh, facility that we have there. And just in Georgia, there's about 20 billion of uh, EV battery related supply chain infrastructure that's being built. And regionally, there's going to be about 40 billion. So there is significant um, support, governmental support. You can imagine all the governments, I mean, all the states want to have that money come in and uh, paying taxes uh, over the next few years. And apart from that, like uh, Steve was saying, we got the, uh, the Investment Reduction Act, the IRA, that is supporting some of these mines and supply chains such as ourselves. We have applied for a few grants and hopefully we were able to access some of that money that is non-dilutive uh, and obviously very beneficial for us to develop our story. But independent of that, we work where the client is. So for example, in some of our uh, business development opportunities, we, work, we, we could start potentially working in Europe and, and so forth. So, and, and we're starting to work in our lithium refinery business as well uh, with a potential client in South America. So when you see that independent of where we are, we are going to be dealing with uh, potential clients in all parts of the world. And we, you know, that's not an issue in terms of, uh, you know, where our clients are, we will go. But the support from the government and these early stages is always going to be needed. But I always say to people that every part of this business is going to have to stand by itself in its own two feet and make sure that makes money independent of government support. But at these initial stages are critical, both on the governmental and obviously on the private side, meaning public capital markets, which is not so hot today. Um, we're going to need that, too. I mean, we're, we're all listed in, in Toronto Stock Exchange and potentially co-listed in, in the U.S. Uh, in the near future. And we're going to need the support from from those capital markets as well. So hopefully, you know, all those things come together over the next few years, because if not, it's going to be a very hard slog trying to finance these projects going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm going to actually hear, Carlos, I'll throw this one way back, right back at you. There was a question while you were away that was going through the audience questions and one that seemed that, <clears throat> excuse me, you'd be able to provide a decent amount of color on. And it comes from, yeah, Mason here is asking, I'll just repeat this for you. Uh, are there any DLE projects looking to come online in the next three months or so? And then, and where does the International Battery Metals or IBAT modular process fall into these upcoming projects? Well, I don't think three months. Uh, <laughs> if, if you count ours uh, as a DLE project, which, you know, you could, I mean, uh, on a much smaller scale, we could potentially be generating revenue uh, in the early uh, early next year. So January in and around that time frame, so Q1 of next year. Uh, but it's a much smaller scale. So on, on a larger scale, we're talking about DLE projects for upstream assets, extracting lithium direct from, you know, from raw material. That's going to take a few years. I mean, you have several in the Arkansas smack over a standard lithium and so forth working away. And you've got some in South America working away there. But those are much larger. Uh, and we're talking about hundreds of millions to billion. On terms of IBAT, I'm not really, uh, I would say, um, knowledgeable enough to to have an opinion there. I will let them speak for themselves. Um, they are working on a DLE. They have a plant or a, a modular um, pilot plant that they're trying to put somewhere, but they haven't been able to uh, to have it. Uh, I would say installed in a client site to make it work. So, but that's all I could say there. I mean, uh, I, I don't know the intrinsics of, of their project, but what I what I do think is that DLE or lithium extraction process, the way we call it, is going to be catered to specific assets. Do not believe the panacea that one DLE is going to be good for the entire solution. In fact, our lithium extraction process that we're working with one client, um, a smaller, and it could be anywhere between 500 to 1,000 tons, is going to be different 
than the one that we're going to be looking at in Europe. And it's going to be different for another one that we're looking at another place in the US. They all have very different ones. I mean, we're utilizing more or less the same technology, but there has other, I would say, cleansing or filtration and so forth that are going to be needed in order to get that uh, product cleaned and extracted from solution. So the DLE or lithium extraction process are, are going to be hopefully a success over the short term. Not necessarily big projects at the beginning, but as you get small and as you get better in what you're doing, you're going to tend to see these projects going to be larger and obviously hopefully successful because we need these projects. Hmm. No, excellent. Thank you. And so this is going to be a, it's a bit of a question that maybe you know, all three of you have partly answered in previous responses, but I just wanted to, to have a chance for you to explain where you fit into the local battery supply chain. And obviously you're, you're all going to have you know, different answers to this, but I mean, local potential buyers of your own product, target market, right? I mean, for developers, we could even expand this to discuss like, bio or JV or taking it to production yourself. Or, and then obviously for full, full circle, I mean, off takes or other agreements to, similar to that, right? Or, and ultimately the question I want to hear you answer, Carlos, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with Steve. But uh, so I wanted to ask you that one. Yeah, I'll wait for that one, Carlos. But Steve, do you, know, do you want to kind of provide some color there? Sure. I, you know, the way I see everything evolving and you, you, is basically you're going to have you know, companies that are able to basically get the value out of the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., aligning with car companies that want to sell to U.S. Uh, consumers. So, you know, the value chain is, is clearly, it started out a couple of years ago, just had Tesla by Reno, Redwood Materials, et cetera, but it's clearly expanded. You see all the battery plants that are coming around in the Midwest of the, uh, the U.S., uh, close by to where the existing auto plants are, and of course, there's also a significant component of automobile manufacturing down by what Carlos is on the southeast seaboard of the, of the U.S. and Quebec, et cetera, like that. You know, the idea is to essentially get uh, an, a lithium end user with offtake um, who recognizes essentially two things, I think. What the value of an off-stream uh, agreement is, in which you can sort of pick your, you know, pick your long-term lithium price. This is always sort of the parlor game I have fun with when I speak to end users. Is what do you think it is? Because of course nobody knows what it is. There's no cost curve. There's no existing, you know, industry. We're we're guessing. All we know is the incentive price has to be considerably higher than what we've seen it in the past. And and if you do the discounted cash flows you know, you have something that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And then the second component is what's the opportunity cost if you haven't secured that material in some of these, you know, years going out? Because you simply won't have a product to sell. I don't really know. To me, it's almost incalculable. Hmm. So we're going to clearly be talking to all the battery makers who are close by. You know, it does everything for us, minimizes the greenhouse gas footprint that people want to talk about to, to their ultimate consumers. Again, we're, we have a finished product, uh, you know, that should be able to go right into a battery. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of different uh, places that we can that we can put our, our lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide as we go we go forward. Awesome. And to you, Ali? Yeah, very much the same. I think, uh, you know, the advantage that we have with respect to jurisdiction, of course, the US and Europe are catching up with gigafactory manufacturing, but uh, China today has the largest number of those gigafactories. The University of Science and Technology in Mongolia is also looking at uh, potentially partnering with us to build that beneficiated product. So uh, there's a couple of different ways that we would look at um, with selling our product. Offtake is certainly one of them, uh, JV type scenario, whereby we bring in a strategic, being be it Asian or otherwise. I think you'll find that in Mongolia today, Elon Musk, uh, for instance, had a call with the prime minister about a month ago asking to to really review their critical mineral act and, and and get involved in that space so there is a fair bit of attention the european automakers are all over mongolia you know the koreans the japanese uh, also equally all over mongolia looking for lithium i think that the, the level of buyers that we will have is rather significant uh, but of course china being on our doorstep uh, makes them front and center Mm -hmm. And so, Carlos, I'll, I'll pass this one to you, but the, the one that I was going to ask that, you know, again, feel free to take this in the direction you wish, but just, I mean, it's a simple question. I mean, who are you buying from and who are you selling to, right? But uh, yeah, just where do you fit into your local battery supply chain? Sure. So um, just a small kind of side note on, on how I see kind of the industry developing 
generally, and that would include kind of the upstream. And I say that because we were in the upstream and we were ready to build and we were looking for financing. It's that you're going to see, similar to what happened in copper and gold, you're going to see different types of, uh, I would say, junior developers, exploration companies that are going to take the product to a certain level. And at that level, some other company comes in and does takes to the next level. And you see that in gold and copper and silver and all that. So that's going to be valuable for the industry. How that's going to evolve in the lithium space and vitamin material metals is going to be, you know, to be seen because there are few producers today, whereas in gold and copper, there's a lot of them. So a lot of knowledge there, but you're going to see that happening there. So not necessarily you're going to see some of these juniors have, uh, I would say, take it all the way to the end. So giving away the offtake may not be beneficial because some of the, the, the I guess, the, the current producers today would want to have exposure to that offtake. And if you sell it too early, that's going to be an issue in terms of valuation. But that just, as a side note, that's just kind of like a comment from the outside in uh, making that. And that, that's, we, we had that issue internally at NEO. And I think those issues, everybody in the industry are, are debating. Now, to our, to our business, uh, we look at it where the client is is where we go. So every client is going to be different. For example, one client that we're working today, we sent a term sheet. They want they they will give us a fee stock for free. We process a fee stock and we sell it back to them at their site. So there's, I mean, it's it's a, essentially a full circle, uh, which is what our name entails. Um, we don't envision that happens happening all the time with all clients. For example, we're working with another client that said, we don't need the product. So what we will do there is that we will process it to a certain point, send it to our Georgia plant or install a Georgia, a plant similar to Georgia near them and then produce lithium carbonate and then sell it to the market at that point. We are not selling, we're not giving any offtake yet to anybody um, in terms of that free product because we don't have that product in our, uh, I guess, uh, in our coffers, in our inventory, but that will depend on the business. And on the battery side, it depends who giving us the battery. Usually the battery is not owned by us, so we're free to sell that product to whoever we want, be that uh, battery manufacturers but uh, or, or OEMs or cathode guys or, or whomever that may look like. So it depends where the product has come from. We're going to have a, a very diverse set of, of offtakes and, and, and supply from different clients that will have different ways that we can, I would say, sell the product uh, to the market. Now, in terms of potentially working with upstream clients in our lithium refinery business, that's a different story. And most likely what will happen there is that we will partner with upstream assets and then we will try to finance the project going forward and that we will share the gains there. So it will be, again, on a project by project basis and it's not necessarily a one size fits all approach. No, excellent. And, and so I think we're kind of, we're circling toward, towards the end here, gentlemen. Mason from the audience has another good question here for you guys. He's just asking, and we'll, we'll start with Steve here, but, but how much do you see Exxon's move into lithium in Arkansas as a shift in the production processes and growth of, of EVs? Well, I think, again, it's, it comes back to the need for all the different types of uh, extraction methods, whether, or sources, I guess I should say lithium sources, and, you know, that kind of thing from, from the hydrocarbon reservoir certainly makes sense. Uh, what I would say is that, it, you know, it remains to be seen how successful it's going to be, just as all of these, whether it's the salt and sea or stuff up in, you know, Western Canada. But the need is there for all of them. So I, I don't think that it's, you know, I don't think that the EV industry necessarily is dependent upon just what Exxon Mobil's doing. But certainly for the concept of what they're doing, I think it's going to play an integral part in the entire you know, global supply uh, profile going forward. Hmm. All you need to add to that one? No, I just echo what Stephen said. I think it's inev inevitable that the oil players start to step into the, the EV space and the lithium space. It happened with tobacco and vaping, and it's, it's going to happen with oil and, and electric vehicles. So it's par for the course, and we're going to see a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's the, the, the theme that you guys are all three of you are, are expanding upon is that that more of everything, right? That there's room room for everybody in this in this world. Uh, and Carlos, yeah, I mean, what, final thoughts on that one? Any, any additional color to add? I always said that once the oil, ga oil and gas companies and the chemical, large chemical companies start coming into the market, that's when it's mainstream and you're starting to see it. If Exxon, if Exxon is doing it, the others will follow. 
and you, you're going to see Chevron, Schlumber just has already been in it. In Argentina, there's oil and gas companies already uh, involved in, in lithium extraction and processing. You're going to see this happening at a much larger scale. So look out for acquisitions in, in these price points uh, and a lot of consolidation. So you're going to see the big boys coming in with a lot more money, with a lot more, I would say, capital to, to, to push around because it's, there's a lot of money to be made. So that would include not only, well, I see three, I think three big ones. One is oil and gas majors, uh, the chemical majors, and then the mining majors are also coming in. So the Rio, you know, Rio Tintos, uh, the, the, the BPs, uh, you know, all those guys are coming in, hopefully, and, and helping um, the financing of this industry. I mean, we need billions, you know, so this, that's the only way to finance this. Hmm. No, excellent. Uh, well, gentlemen, I think that that does bring us to the end of our of our questions and our interview here today. So yeah, again, another strong interview, three, three articulate gentlemen. And, and yeah, thank you for your time, guys, and enjoy the rest of your day.